I want to thank uh, Brody Campus. Last week they uh, hosted our 10th annual Turkey Bowl. This was a, 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 a valiant fight between the students and the adults last week. Uh, we had it down to Brody Campus out on their big field, and it was really, really fun. I know it's our 10th one because Mike has been on our staff for 10 years, and this is his kind of 10th Christmas. Is it, is it 11th Christmas this year? It's many Christmases, <laughs> that's all we know, but uh, it was really, really fun, and we were really thankful for it. We're going to turn our attention to Hebrews this morning, I want to do it in, a, in, a, in just a second, but there, there's a name that you probably don't n- know very well, his name's Paul Marcarelli. Does anybody know that name? Well, you, you know of him. You know of him uh, because he was on TV a lot until last year in a commercial by Verizon. And there was probably a catchphrase that you remember when he would go in and test the coverage of Verizon cell phones. Every place he would go, he would lift the phone to his ear and say what? Can you hear me now? Exactly. It's amazing how uh, commercials get in our head and they're there, you know. Uh, Paul Marcarelli started that. He thought it was just a small little commercial gig, but it ended up running almost eight years. And he did uh, really hundreds of these commercials. He did them in, in local areas and he did them for national TV. And he made a lot of money off of that one commercial. If you can get a gig like that, you need to take it, okay? I'm just telling you this is my one piece of advice for today. And as you take that, you can, uh, you can be sure that it marks you for the rest of your time. In fact, one of, the, one of the parts of his contract is he couldn't tell or talk about that at all. He couldn't, he, he, it was under a gag order. So all the media was trying to get a hold of him and talk to him about this commercial and things like that. But Verizon had contractually said, you cannot speak. And so he had to be quiet about all of it. Well, then after his contract was over last year in 2011, you know, everybody came after him to ask him about that. And he talked about how lucrative it was and how wonderful it was to, to have that kind of ongoing employment because oftentimes actors don't get that. He said, he said it did have downsides, and the downside is that whenever anybody would see him, they would say, can you hear me now? Exactly right. Hey, can you hear me now? He said the worst was his beloved grandmother was being lured into the grave, and a family friend who sat behind him at the funeral said, can you hear me now? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so uh, Paul Mark Raleigh said, I'll be glad that it's over. But you know what? Hearing is different than somebody speaking. Speaking happens all the time. Oftentimes, hearing does not occur as easily. You know that, especially if you live in a family. Uh, You know that a lot of talking goes on that you don't really hear. Um, We have our Stephen ministry, which we're beginning again in in January, and they have 50 hours of training. And I dare say that the bulk of the 50 hours of training for Stephen ministry is teaching listening skills. It's sort of interesting, isn't it, that we have to be taught listening skills, and yet it's true. We have to be taught it in our families. We have to be taught it in all our relationships because oftentimes what happens is we simply don't hear even though people are speaking. We know that because uh, we watch Charlie Brown and every Christmas we watch Charlie Brown and all the adults in Charlie Brown's Christmas do what? <laughs> Exactly. Thank you, Brody, too. Wah, 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 wah. That's the parents. You don't really hear what they have to say. It's amazing you all know all these things, right? They're all stuck in your head somewhere. Wah, 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 wah. Well, you know what? Here's a premise that we have in Christianity that grows out of our encounter with God in the Old and New Testament, and this is this, that God is speaking. God is speaking to us, and he's speaking to us, and one of the keys for those of us who have responded to the grace of God in Jesus Christ is beginning to learn how to listen to that. Now, we have that when we turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 1 today. Hebrews chapter 1 is the beginning of a book that was written largely to Hebrew Christians. 
These are people who lived in Israel, for instance, or in the Jewish communities outside of Israel, and they responded to the grace of God as the Messiah, the coming one, the one they had been preparing for, watching for, waiting for. All those things were a part of their lives, and now they saw it come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Well, there in Jerusalem and all over Israel, as they responded, the church was born. And that first 70 years after Jesus died and went to be with the Father were real seminal years in, in the life of the church as it began to grow wildly. What happened, however, is the powers that be in Israel pushed back against them. And one of the ways they pushed back against them is because Christians claim that Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament. As theologically, they would go back and push against it. And they push against it in a lot of ways. The book of Hebrews is responding to those pushbacks and in a lot of different ways. For instance, today it's going to talk about angels a little bit, and we're going to talk about that as well. But in the book of Hebrews, it's really talking to these Hebrew Christians. It's beginning to help them to know how to listen for God in what God's doing in a new way in Jesus Christ. And it's with that in mind that I want to go to our text today. We're going to put it up on the screen, and I'm going to read it for you and then stop at various places as we do. It says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Now, I just want to stop right there. Just keep that there in your mind and think about that. In the past, God spoke to us through our ancestors and through the prophets and in various ways. God is still speaking. God continues to speak, and God has spoken in the past. That's, that's the good news of the Old Testament and the New Testament. God is not silent. Remember, we asked three major questions this year. We've been looking at them all year, and each time something in the Scripture comes up, I point them out to you because I think they're questions that I have wanted you to be articulate in. The first one is this, the question that humanity asks, and you could probably give them back to me because we've said them so often. Does God exist? Is there a God? That's the first question, and that's a question that's asked over and over again in our culture. Is there a God? The second one is, is God knowable? Can we know God? Can we understand and, and know God? That's a, a deep second question that follows it. The third question is, does it matter? Does it make any difference in our life if we can answer the other two in a positive way? Well, the scripture says yes to all three of those. And it does so by telling us there is a God, and it's a God who speaks, and that God is knowable. Not simply because we can discern through rational thought or, or intellectual assent that God, uh, what God is like, but because God has made God's self know, known to us. And it says that he spoke in various ways. Now, we know God speaks to us, and one of the ways we listen to God and we hear God is by understanding how God speaks to us. For instance, God has spoken to us through a creation. We looked at that a couple weeks ago when we talked about worship grows out of our encounter with wonder and awe out in the world around us. We can, we can look at creation, see the complexity and the order that's found there, and God speaks to us that of his order and the beauty which is found there. We see that God speaks through creation. And for those of us who want to listen to God, to be attentive to that is very, very important. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that we often lose touch with. You know, as a horticulturist, I, 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 I love to spend time in the garden. And one of the reasons I love to spend time in the garden is I just see the intricacies of God's work in the world. And through creation, God speaks and one of the things that we need to pay attention to is when we're out in the world is listening in that. But God also speaks through events, through the, through the events of our lives. All of us ha could probably tell a story where at one point we just, we just heard from God in some, some way that spoke to us, some sense of God's presence there. Now, it's not a verbal speaking. It's a sense that God speaks to us through the events and the occurrences of our lives. God speaks to us in all sorts of ways. We, we, we've said that God speaks to us in stillness. And we looked at the psalm that said, be still and know that I am God. And this is one of the things that we have to cultivate in our life because it's not a natural part of our life. If we had no media, none of the uh, ability to drive places, all those kind of things like they have in the past, stillness would have been a part of all of our lives. It's not now. 
In fact, it has to be developed. It's not a natural thing in our world. God speaks through creation and through events, speaks through silliness. He, he speaks through blessings. Think about the blessings you have at Thanksgiving when you sat down at a table. If you really sat down and lived in the moment and just thought about the, the blessings that God has poured out on you, God's speaking of his care and his kindness and, and, and his, his wonder, you see. So God speaks to us in a million ways, but God speaks to us not only through the good things, he also speaks to us through the hard things. Many of you would tell stories of God really coming to you and you, you sensing God's com- comfort or peace even in the midst of trials or pain. And, and last week we talked about how worship grows out of brokenness. You remember that? And it's because God speaks to us. C.S. Lewis said it's like God's megaphone. When, when pain is in our life, we, we sense God more and more and more. Uh, we do this little exercise oftentimes when we have a group of people together and we have them draw their timeline, the ups and downs of their lives, and ask the question of when would God most evident to you in these, this timeline of your life. And what's interesting is oftentimes they'll put highs in their lives and lows in their lives, and then they'll draw a countervailing line that goes up when their lows occur. It, I see it happen all the time. They're so aware of God's presence, even in the tra- pain and the trials, which is so counterintuitive to what we might think, but God does speak to us in that way. Well, one of the other ways that God speaks to us is through angels. Isn't that weird? In the Old Testament and New Testament. Now, this is hard for me to understand. In fact, I haven't done a whole lot of thinking about angels. It's not something I think about a lot, but at Christmas time, they're everywhere. I mean, think about it. How many of you have an angel somewhere in your house in your decorations? Just show of hands. Yeah, 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 I thought. Most of us have one. We're surrounded by these angels, but we don't think much about angels, right? We have an angel that was given to us a couple years ago. It's an angel that is, sits about 18 inches high and holds a, um, holds a candle. And, and the woman who gave it to us gave it to us in March, not at Christmas time. She came as a house guest and she brought something with us. It was an angel that holds this candle just like this. <laughs> I mean, for hours, not even moving, just... And this angel does this, but what happens is, apparently she got it at a clearance sale because its its wings aren't really affixed. They they slip in there, but when they do, my artist's wife swears that they're upside down, and so she continually tries to fix it so that they're the other way. Well, I swear that that's the right way for them to go, and so we're constantly walking through the house and shifting the angel wings up and down on this thing. We're surrounded by angels all the time, and again, we don't think about them very much. You know, angels are simply, uh, in, in the Old and New Testament, it, it comes from the word that just simply means messenger. It means to tell something. Now, you'll see angels tonight if you come to our children's program at 5.30 here at the William Cannon campus, and everybody will know what this is, Right? I mean, as soon as a kid puts these on, you look at him and go, oh, an angel, right? Now, how do you know that's an angel, right? Have you ever thought about it? How do I know it? It's because somebody started drawing angels, and they all have little wings, and uh, you know, over and over again, they get cuter as they go by, and tonight you'll see some major cuteness if you come. <laughs> In fact, that's why everybody brings their, their, their uh, cameras. But I know it because on the angel wing, it says it right there. Angel wings, one pair. <laughs> right? You know that. Well, I, I, got you, I want you to know that this is quite fine that these look like angel wings to you, and that's quite okay. However, the biblical model is not so much like this. In fact, when angels show up in the Old Testament, usually people are afraid. They're scared to death, right? Now, sometimes at our little Christmas pageant, I've been scared to death when they walk out as well, but <laughs> it won't happen tonight. But they are. They're scared to death because they, they, they see these things. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about angels from a biblical point of view. Angels are not, like Della Reese, somebody who has died and gone up and now comes back as an angel. That's not what they are in the Old and New Testament. Angels are created spiritual beings who are in service to God. 
That's what angels are. Now, they're God's messenger, and they're a messenger like any one of the messengers that God has used. In fact, when he says he, he uses it in various ways, he speaks of angels as one of those ways. In fact, at the New Testament story, if you look in the book of Luke, angels show up quite often. They show up, for instance, when people are alone, largely, and they show up to tell about something God's about to do. For instance, angels showed up to Joseph and said, hey, uh, your girlfriend's pregnant, right? That, that would be scary right there, <laughs> you know, a frightening thing, but that's when, what, what the angel said. The angel also came in and said to Zechariah, he said, uh, the, the Lord has fulfilled your prayers. Uh, God is answering your prayers that you would see the Messiah before you died. And he comes to Zechariah in that. Mary, or Elizabeth, excuse me, the cousin of Mary, also has an angel visit them. And each time, the message is there that speaks uh, of, of what God's about to do. That is the purpose of angels in that. That's why when we go to Christmas trees, we have angels all over them because they're just a symbol of that. But what's happened is, instead of being this sort of sense of, oh my gosh, God's speaking, they become just a cute little thing that's there. And I tell you that because I want you, as you go into this Christmas, to just be, pay attention to angels this time. Because what it says behind it and the theological truth that is behind and underneath each one of those angels that you see is that God's still speaking, right? And God just spoken in various ways. It says he spoke through the prophets. It says he spoke through various means through stillness, through creation, through their trials, through pain. God is speaking and speaking to you now. And so even in the scripture, it talks about this. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors, to the prophets at many, many times and in various ways. But, and this is the important part of the scripture, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You see, all of those things that went on before now come to fruition in Jesus Christ. And so when you begin to ask the question, why do we not see angels today? What, are, what is that? And it, this is one of those answers that, that the pinnacle of God speaking, the, the point of God speaking in our lives is through his son, Jesus Christ. And though he sent prophets in the past, now he has sent his very son. And there are a lot of different parables about that. For instance, there's a parable about how um, the owner of a vineyard sent his hired workers to, to talk to the vineyard, the people who were working in the vineyard, and they killed every one of them. And so finally he sends his son. You remember that story? And that story then tells us a little bit about how he sends his son. And he says, now he speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's how God speaks at this moment. And in these last days, he's spoken to us. And then it gives some characteristics about this. It says this, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. This is his son, co-equal with God, intimately involved there. Let's keep going on that. And as he, the son is the radiance of God's glory. Do you see that? The radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. He's describing that son that he just said he speaks through. Now, the word radiance is a word that sort of shows us a little bit about it. Uh, the sun, for instance, if you were to look at it in, a, in an eclipse, you know how the sun gets covered up and what you see are the fireballs coming off the sun on the outside when it's a perfect eclipse and around that. Especially when you look through a telescope, you can see that coming off of it. That's the radiance that comes off of it. In the same way, this is what Jesus is. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, it, it says, He is the visible image of the invisible God, the radiance of God's glory a representation of his being. He sustains all things by his powerful words, and after he has provided purification for sins, that's what he's done on the cross. That's what we celebrate in communion. When you come up here today, we're going to see the results of the Son's work, for this is where God has spoken. And that's each time we share in communion. We 
taste the bread. And in a tangible way, we understand what God's done for you. He has forgiven you by his son, Jesus Christ. He has called you into new life and made you a new person. In fact, the scripture says, if any was in Christ, they are a new person. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God has spoken and speaks even today. For he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, the son of, of the majesty, excuse me. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. The Hebrew people didn't understand exactly what Jesus had come to do and to be. And after he died and rose again, they understood him as the Messiah, the one who was to come to fulfill all the promise that was there. And it was a promise that was fulfilled on the cross when he took our sins upon himself. It was a promise that was fulfilled when he overcame death and his resurrection gave us new life. And they were saying to the Christians of those early days, yeah, but he's not, he's just a messenger. He's just a prophet. He's like the prophets of old. And the writer of Hebrews wants to clarify that and says, no, where God has spoken to the prophets of old in the Old Testament, it wants to show that he's not simply a prophet. He is, in fact, the son of God. And by his powerful word, he's able to make you clean and clear. You know, this Christmas, it could be like Christmases that we've had in the past where we're so distracted by the busyness of the season that we forget to listen to a God who is speaking. But that God is still speaking today, and he's speaking to you. And part of the Advent responsibility is slowing ourselves down in those quiet places of our lives to listen, to open up the scriptures and to read once again the story of Jesus. For in that story, we find God who is knowable, a God who speaks to our life, and it makes all the difference. And I hope for you this Christmas season that you will begin a commitment once again to listen to that son as he speaks. It begins here with communion on this first Sunday of Advent. As you walk forward and as you take the bread and drink from the cup by dipping it into the cup, you'll share together in that good news that has come down to us through all the ages because God's speaking. Even as he spoke, he continues to speak today. Let's pray together.